Hi, my name is Tom Fate and I teach creative writing here at the College of DuPage. Today's guest, Stuart Dybeck, is the author of five books of fiction, Ecstatic Cahoots, Paper Lantern, I Sailed with Magellan, The Coast of Chicago, and Childhood, and Other Neighborhoods. He's also published two collections of poetry, Streets in Their Own Ink and Brass Knuckles. His fiction, poetry, and nonfiction have appeared in The New Yorker, Harper's, The Atlantic, Poetry, Tin House, and many other magazines, and they've been widely anthologized. Today we're going to talk about his recent book, Ecstatic Cahoots, and the nature of the short story. Welcome, Stuart. Thanks, Tom. So, Stuart, your most uh, recent book, Ecstatic Cahoots, includes 50 short stories in less than 200 pages. And I'm curious how you decided to use that structure, the kind of snapshot stories, and then you've got some more conventional stories, and then some like paragraph long stories. And um, how did you decide to include that kind of mix in a book? I, I've been wanting to write a book like that for a long time because I've been writing these little miniature pieces ever since college. Um, I had a couple of friends who were interested, and we'd have these people still wrote letters in those days. And we mail them back and forth to one another. And as they began to accumulate, I began to wonder what to do with them because magazines, there really wasn't a, a home for them in magazines at, at that time. And uh, I also write poetry, so I would uh, send them to poetry magazines as prose poems. And uh, at some point, not just me, but the literary culture, I began to notice that other people were writing these and they weren't calling them prose poems. They were they had all kinds of different names. And the little bit of research that was possible to do back then, I began realizing that other cultures were writing them too. For instance, the, um, the, uh, the, in China they were called smoke along. <laughs> and the idea was that for the length of, it would take you to smoke a cigarette, you would have a story to read. Uh, in uh, Japan, the first uh, Nobel Prize winning Japanese writer and one of my favorite writers, uh, Kawabata, called his palm of the hand stories, hmm. uh, meaning a story that could fit in the palm of the hand. So um, this little form that I thought that I'd kind of just made up and played around with myself on, on a little bit of exploration, it made me realize that it had been there a long time, far before me. And, uh, uh, I think the turning point in uh, fiction in the United States for, for this form was a collection, an anthology Norton put out maybe in the 90s called Sudden Fiction. As soon as I saw it, I realized that something in the culture had changed. There, there, there was now a door that people, or maybe a mail slot, <laughs> that people writing these things could could, could put them in. But um, I, like you, I teach creative writing. And I, I used a lot of pieces from that book, Sudden Fiction. I would bring them into my fiction class because they would stimulate a, 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 an interesting discussion on the part of the students as to what is a story and what isn't a story. Yeah. And, and you know, everybody had their own opinion. Nobody was right. Nobody was wrong. Was relative <laughs> Relativity <laughs> Yeah. was king at the, of this discussion. So, so uh, like some of the pieces seem kind of like snapshots or images or kind right. of framed images where you kind of, and I like a lot of them because that you kind of like both limit the reader but also invite the reader into the image at mm -hmm. the same time. Um, so when those students are like having the conversations about whether those kinds of stories are stories, do they talk about like character and plot or is that not even the point? Is it more? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, it depends a lot on the student. And, okay. You know, and, and, the, and the, somebody can, all it takes, I think, is for one, one story of that length to connect with you. Yeah. And then it, it isn't that you get it exactly, but you, it, if you've kind of staked out a position, you might be willing to expand your own definition uh, of what a story does. In the 20th century, continuing on into the 21st century, um, the, the same discussion was going on with poetry. Hmm. And in fact, it, I mean, it goes on to this day. If, if I, say, teach a poetry class at, let's say, a senior center, 
I am invariably going to get um, people who were schooled and raised in um, the notion that a poem should rhyme. Yeah. It should be compressed. Right. It should have basic uh, rhyme, uh, rhythm scheme, iambic pentameter, etc. <clears throat> and if you walk in there with free verse, um, I, I mean, it, not so much anymore, but e even 20 years ago, uh, there would be people in that class who would say, well, this isn't a poem. Keats wouldn't call this a poem. Yeah. And um, so, uh, you know, one of the things that happened in the 20th century uh, in poetry, one of the things that happened in all the arts, painting wasn't just pictures anymore. It could be designs. Mm -hmm. It could be abstractions. Right. Music didn't necessarily have to have a, a hummable, whistleable, whistleable melody. So in... in when modernism came, all the arts kind of had these yeah. little expanded definitions of it. And, and, and in some sense, um, what, what is now being called flash fiction, though it, it wasn't a few years ago, it kind of a zippy, zippy thing to call it, is, is a version of that. You know, mm -hmm. that do, you th do you think that like students today are more... Um, engaged by it in part because of the web and the internet and a kind of interconnected frag, you know, a series of interconnected fragments make more sense to them than long blocks of text in terms I, of their attention. Yeah, I, attention. I think that that could be argued. I, I don't I don't know that anybody's done any any studies of it. Uh, but I mean, I want to rush to say that this form was around right long before the internet, right? And um, I, the prose poem was being written back in the 19th century. So it, you know, if we have time, I'll tell you a quick anecdote. Yeah. I think the book is called Time and Again. Okay. <clears throat> Beautifully written. And basically, here's what, it, what, here's what happens. So that at time travel stories, which I love, all, all need a good invention in, as to how you can do that. And in this uh, book, the... Um, Invention is sensory deprivation. Uh, a, a, a guy in the 50s who's uh, in advertising, and he's an advertising writer, drawer, artist, mm -hmm. is locked in the Dakota Hotel. The shades are all drawn, and he's just kept there in sensory deprivation, and he goes out one night in a snowstorm, and he sees a horse and carriage go by, and he thinks it's just the horse and carriages in Central Park. And he suddenly realizes, wait, and he realizes that he's now traveling in time. Most time travel stories are love stories, mm. if you think about it. So this becomes a love story, and he, he's back in the 1890s or something, and he meets a woman in the 1890s, and, and no television. People still play game, parlor games, and they're playing parlor games and there's frost on the window, and he takes, it might be one of her bobby pins, and he makes a sketch of her in the frost. And he knows it's the, the best sketch he's ever done in his life. And he's just thrilled that he's, that he's nailed it because he wants to impress her. Mm -hmm. And he wants the sketch to be a kind of a safe way to say, I'm attracted to you. And she looks at it. And she says, oh, oh, that's nice. And he realizes she's just being polite. And he can't understand what's happened. And then he suddenly realizes that in the 1890s, the kind of drawings that they're looking at are all very filled in. Mm -hmm. And that by the 50s and 60s, advertising, advertising drawings Changed. Are, are little sketches and that the whole population from his time would get how good that was. Right. And, you know, a, a parallel for today would be, I, I mean, I really wonder how somebody who saw film in the 30s would react to our commercials today. Right. They move so fast. Right. But every, you know, a, a five-year-old sitting there can follow them because it's part of his culture. Okay, so it's a long roundabout way to getting back to flash fiction. If, if you approach it with 1890 eyes, mm 
it's kind of hard to see what the story's going on in there, but it, it's, a, it's a 21st century right. take on the, on the short story. You can reject it, you can like it, but that's kind of what's going on, I think. Um, could I get you to read a couple of these short pieces? Uh, sure. We could talk a little bit about story. Sure. I'll read one with, uh, people like to say sometimes, did that happen? <laughs> So this happened. Uh, I changed the name. It barely fills a page. Uh, it's called Confession. And uh, it tells a little story. I, so, Father Bogoslaw was the priest I always waited for, the one whose breath through the thin partition of the confessional reminded me of the ventilator behind Vic's tap. He huffed and smacked as if in response to my dull litany of sins. And I pictured him slouched in his cubicle, draped in vestments, the way he sat slumped in the back entrance to the sacristy on cold mornings before saying morning mass, hung over, sucking an unlit palm mal, exhaling smoke. Once his head thudded against the wooden box. Father, I whispered, Father. But he was out snoring. I knelt wondering what to do until he finally groaned and hacked himself awake. As usual, I'd saved the deadly sins for last, the lies and copied homework, snitching drinks, ditching school, hitchhiking, which I'd been convinced was an offense against the fifth commandment which prohibited suicide. Before I reached the dirty snapshots of Korean girls, stolen from the dresser of my war hero uncle, Uncle Al, and still unrepentantly catched behind the oil shed, Father B knocked and said I was forgiven. As for penance, go in peace, my son. I'm suffering enough today for both of us. <laughs> I love that story. Thank um, you. So, so that feels like a story to me, like I'm always thinking of my students asking about, is that a story? Because there's a, in a very few words, there are, um, there's a conflict, there's a round character, the suggestion of an entire life and of adolescence, right. and that kind of twist at the end where you kind of get the feeling that maybe the kid should be taking the confession from the father. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I, uh, I like that reading very much. Yeah. Um, so it's got a punchline like a joke. It's, an an it's short as an anecdote. If we all s were, say, sitting at a bar and started telling stories about our different religious upbringing, somebody might have a story about a rabbi and somebody's story about a parson and a right. story about a piece. And, and we call trading stories like that telling anecdotes. And uh, in a creative writing class, you'd say, OK, you know, well, it's, it's good if you're a writer and you're also a rock contour, but the two are not the same. You have to somehow take an anecdote and, and make it a little, a little bit more substantial than just the kind of a, a barroom story. And, you know, for me, that was the risk. That was the job of that story. And, and, and when you give it that uh, beautifully turned phrase, the priest should be asking forgiveness from the sinner, that that's great. I mean, if, if, if it does that, then I'm happy. And I mean, and I like what you said about that you can't, you know, there's a difference between telling a story in a bar and writing a story. And like usually when you're sitting next to someone in a bar, they don't say things like, whose breath through the thin partition of the confessional reminded me of the ventilator behind Vic's tap, which is this beautiful metaphor. I love yeah. it. Um, so how about reading a, a really short one that is a little bit different um, stylistically like, um, is there one you want to read like that? I thought of, um, was it In Between? Uh, yeah, I'll be, I'll be happy. Or Between. Read. Between. Between, yeah. And then maybe a little bit of how these are similar and different. Between. Between guilt and desire, thought and act, deja and vu, between ampersand and cross, wing and air, all she made possible and all she made impossible. Between river and eel, loving and leaving, 
a life like the exhalation that separates wine and wine, between mute and mime, between the rhyme of night and light, dream and waking from a nap in the afternoon darkness of what could have been a total eclipse, but actually was an April thunderstorm. I thought the sound of men lifting long lengths of rain gutter from a pickup truck was a meteor shower rattling against the metal awning over Sun's Oriental food store. Now that piece is, am I um, odd in my hearing that as like, or being able to imagine this lined out as a poem, unlike the, the, the first piece you read, which seems like a more conventional narrative? Right. So, um, and one, you know, going way back to your earliest question, why assemble all these in a book? One of, one of the things I wanted to do is assemble like-looking pieces that were operating in entirely different ways. So that as a reader, each time you turned the page to a new piece, you didn't know exactly how that one was going to work. Mm -hmm. So this one clearly isn't... I, I can't any, <laughs> imagine anybody <laughs> sitting at our bar <laughs> having <laughs> traded <laughs> stories about Parsons and priests and rabbis and suddenly somebody breaks out with between, <laughs> you just kind of pick up your drink. Whoa, dude, <laughs> let me buy you one. <laughs> so yeah, it's, but you know, I, I mentioned the prose poem earlier and I, it's, it's working um, m much more in that direction. Language is way more important to the piece. Mm -hmm. And um, I could imagine um, confession that everybody gets it on one hearing uh, one reading. I think between is kind of at, says, well, think about this one, and, and if, if you like the way it sounded and it puzzled you enough in a good way, maybe you want to reread it. Mm -hmm. But it, 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 as the title said, I, you know, for me, I see it being caught in between. We're not in this world. We're not in that world. We, we're kind of a neutral or in a decisionless limbo. Mm -hmm. And in, in some ways, maybe one of the things that this f little form is really good at is catching those in-between moments uh, mm -hmm. where the narrative hasn't taken them from the start to the finish. Right. And, and yet, there's something there. So it, you don't, in, it doesn't seem like you see like real boundaries between forms in many ways. Like you, you're pretty fluid in your movement between um, narrative poetry and flash fiction and conventional fiction and you write them all simultaneously? I do. I, I, it comes from um, reading everything as a kid and I, I mean as a kid if there was a mother goose rhyme mm. and a fairy tale at, for bedtime I wouldn't really make a if I liked it I liked it and um, one of the things that disappoints me about uh, education is that a at some point, it, people who enjoyed verse and still love it in rap music and hip hop and Bob Dylan songs seem to have made a wall between prose and, yeah. and poetry. And I, I think that's a real loss that... Um, as, as human beings, you, you, you need them both. You need poetry in your life. I mean, we have that phrase. You don't necessarily need poems in your life, but you need that, mm. that impulse to... Poetry makes life more intense. Just the way we need music. And um, I think something happened as well in the 20th century, going back to that whole notion of modernism. And it, it became complicated and intimidating in a way that uh, I'm sorry to see. Yeah. It, that never really happened with me. I've, I've always had them both close at hand. And so one of the, I, th I guess one of the goals I have as a writer is to, is to combine them to, to invite that fiction reader into the, into the domain of poetry to, 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 to invite poetry into fiction mm -hmm. and maybe uh, vice versa. I mean, at one time, 
the greatest storytellers were poets. Homer, um, the, the, the thing that both poetry and fiction uh, maybe first and foremost allow us to do as human beings, and the thing that distinguishes us as human beings is our memory. As terrifying a disease as we have is Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's so terrifying about it is that you lose your humanity. Yeah. And when you recast history into a story, you remember it. Narrative makes, makes you remember history. Right. That, that's why the old um, uh, people from Homer's times and um, Beowulf and all those old epics, that was telling the history of the tribe, yeah. King Arthur tales. Poetry does the exact same thing. One of the great powers that rhyme had, so it's dispensed, keeping in mind when you dispense it, you're, you're giving up that little bit of power, is that when you rhyme things, I mean, I, you know, why is it that we can remember Cole Porter songs, Bob Dylan songs, rap songs? It's, it's those rhymes, our memory, keep, keep um, encoded in our memory. That, that interrelationship between poetry and, and, and prose both starts with the fact that it, it makes it possible to, to remember. Well, let's see, Homer, Bob Dylan, who else did you bring up? I there? say potato, you say potato. <laughs> I say tomato, you say tomato. I mean, why in the world could I remember that? I, it's just because of the, the, the interplay of language. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Stuart, thanks for coming in today, and I appreciate you talking about your book, and um, um, look forward to the next time you can visit. Thanks so much. Real pleasure. Likewise.